My first step was to call upon our young lady amateur of anarchism at her private house. She received me in a flattering way. I judged that she knew nothing of the chemical and or other operations going on at the top of the house in Hermian Street. The printing of anarchist literature was the only activity she seemed to be aware of there. She was displaying very strikingly the usual signs of severe enthusiasm and had already written many sentimental articles with ferocious conclusions. I could see she was enjoying herself hugely with all the gestures and grimaces of deadly earnestness. They suited her big-eyed, broad-browed face and the good carriage of her shapely head crowned by a magnificent lot of brown hair done in an unusual and becoming style. Her brother was in the room, too, a serious youth with arched eyebrows and wearing a red necktie, who struck me as being absolutely in the dark about everything in the world, including himself. And by and by, a tall young man came in. He was clean-shaved, with a strong bluish jaw, and something of the air of a taciturn actor or of a fanatical priest, the type with thick black eyebrows, you know. But he was very presentable indeed. He shook hands at once vigorously with each of us. The young lady came up to me and murmured sweetly, Comrade Severin. I had never seen him before. He had little to say to us, but sat down by the side of the girl, and they fell at once into earnest conversation. She leaned forward in her deep armchair and took her nicely rounded chin in her beautiful white hand. He looked attentively into her eyes. It was the attitude of love-making, serious, intense, as if on the brink of the grave. I suppose she felt it necessary to round and complete her assumption of advanced ideas of revolutionary lawlessness by making believe to be in love with an anarchist. And this one, I repeat, was extremely presentable, notwithstanding his fanatical, black-browed aspect. After a few stolen glances in their direction, I had no doubt that he was in earnest. As to the lady, her gestures were unapproachable, better than the very thing itself in the blended suggestion of dignity, sweetness, condescension, fascination, surrender, and reserve. She interpreted her conception of what that precise sort of lovemaking should be with consummate art, and so far she too, no doubt, was in an earnest, gestures, but so perfect. After I had been alone with our lady amateur, I informed her, guardedly, of the object of my visit. I hinted at our suspicions. I wanted to hear what she would have to say, and half expected some perhaps unconscious revelation. All she said was, that's serious, looking delightfully concerned and grave. But there was a sparkle in her eyes, which meant plainly how exciting. After all, she knew little of anything except of words. Still, she undertook to put me in communication with Henri, who was not easy to find unless in Hermione Street, where I did not wish to show myself just then. I met Henri. This was another kind of a fanatic altogether. I exposed to him the conclusion we in Brussels had arrived at, and pointed out the significant series of failures. To this he answered with irrelevant exaltation, I have something in hand that shall strike terror into the heart of these gorged brutes. And then I learned that, by excavating in one of the cellars of the house, he and some companions had made their way into the vaults under the great public building I have mentioned before, the blowing up of a whole wing was a certainty as soon as the materials were ready. I was not so appalled at the stupidity of that move as I might have been had not the usefulness of our center in Hermione Street become already very problematic. 
In fact, in my opinion, it was much more of a police trap by this time than anything else. What was necessary now was to discover what, or rather who, was wrong, and I managed at last to get that idea into Henri's head. He glared, perplexed, his nostrils working as if he were sniffing treachery in the air. And here comes a piece of work which will no doubt strike you as a sort of theatrical expedient. And yet what else could have been done? The problem was to find out the untrustworthy member of the group. But no suspicion could be fastened on one more than another. To set up a watch upon them all was not very practicable. Besides, that proceeding often fails. In any case, it takes time, and the danger was pressing. I felt certain that the premises in Herrian Street would be ultimately raided, though the police had evidently such confidence in the informer that the house, for the time being, was not even watched. Henri was positive on that point. Under the circumstances, it was an unfavorable symptom. Something had to be done quickly. I decided to organize a raid myself upon the group. Do you understand? A raid of other trusty comrades personating the police. A conspiracy within a conspiracy. You see the object of it, of course. When apparently about to be arrested, I hoped the informer would betray himself in some way or other, either by some unguarded act or simply by his unconcerned demeanor for instance. Of course, there was the risk of complete failure and the no lesser risk of some fatal accident in the course of resistance, perhaps, or in the efforts at escape. For, as you will easily see, the Hermian Street group had to be actually and completely taken unawares, as I was sure they would be by the real police before very long. The informer was amongst them, and on Ray, alone could be let into the secret of my plan. I will not enter into the detail of my preparations. It was not very easy to arrange, but it was done very well, with a really convincing effect. The sham police invaded the restaurant, whose shutters were immediately put up. The surprise was perfect. Most of the Hermian Street party were found in the second cellar, enlarging the hole communicating with the vaults of the great public building. At the first alarm, several comrades bolted through impulsively into the aforesaid vault where, of course, had this been a genuine raid, they would have been hopelessly trapped. We did not bother about them for the moment. They were harmless enough. The top floor caused considerable anxiety to Henri and myself. There, surrounded by tins of stones dried soup, a comrade, nicknamed the Professor, he was an ex-science student, was engaged in perfecting some new detonators. He was an abstracted, self-confident, sallow little man, armed with large round spectacles, and we were afraid that under a mistaken impression he would blow himself up and wreck the house about our ears. I rushed upstairs and found him already at the door, on the alert, listening, as he said, to suspicious noises down below. Before I had quite finished explaining to him what was going on, he shrugged his shoulders disdainfully and turned away to his balances and test tubes. He was the true spirit of an extreme revolutionist. Explosives were his faith, his hope, his weapon and his shield. He perished a couple of years afterwards in a secret laboratory through the premature explosion of one of his improved detonators. Hurrying down again, I found an impressive scene in the gloom of the big cellar. The man who personated the inspector, he was no stranger to the part, was speaking harshly and giving bogus orders to his bogus subordinates for the removal of his prisoners. Evidently, nothing enlightening had happened so far. Henri, Saturnine, and Swarthy 
waited with folded arms, and his patient, moody expectation had an air of stoicism while in keeping with the situation. I detected in the shadows one of the Hermian Street group surreptitiously chewing up and swallowing a small piece of paper, some compromising scrap, I suppose, perhaps just a note of a few names and addresses. He was a true and faithful companion. But the fund of secret malice which lurks at the bottom of our sympathies caused me to feel amused at that perfectly uncalled-for performance. In every other respect, the risky experiment, the theatrical coup, if you like to call it so, seemed to have failed. The deception could not be kept up much longer. The explanation would bring about a very embarrassing and even grave situation. The man who had eaten the paper would be furious. The fellows who had bolted away would be angry too. To add to my vexation, the door communicating with the other cellar where the printing presses were flew open and our young lady, revolutionist, appeared a black silhouette in a close-fitting dress and a large hat, with the blaze of gas flaring in there at her back. Over her shoulder I perceived the arch eyebrows and the red necktie of her brother. The last people in the world I wanted to see then. They had gone that evening to some amateur contest for the delectation of the poor people, you know, but she had insisted on leaving early, on purpose to call in Hermion Street on the way home under the pretext of having some work to do. Her usual task was to correct the proofs of the Italian and French editions of the alarm bell and the firebrand. Heavens, I murmured, I had been shown once a few copies of these publications. Nothing, in my opinion, could have been less fit for the eyes of a young lady. They were the most advanced things of the sort, advanced, I mean, beyond all bounds of reason and decency. One of them preached the dissolution of all social and domestic ties. The other advocated systematic murder. To think of a young girl calmly tracking printer's errors all along the sort of abominable sentences I remembered was intolerable to my sentiment of womanhood. Mr. X, after giving me a glance, pursued steadily. I think, however, that she came mostly to exercise her fascinations upon Severin, and to receive his homage in her queenly and condescending way. She was aware of both, her power and his homage, and enjoyed them with... I dare say, complete innocence. We had no ground in expediency or morals to quarrel with her on that account. Charm and woman, and exceptional intelligence and man, are a law unto themselves, is it not so? I refrain from expressing my abhorrence of that licentious doctrine because of my curiosity. But what happened then, I hastened to ask. X went on crumbling slowly a small piece of bread with a careless left hand. What happened, in effect, he confessed, is that she saved the situation. She gave you an opportunity to end your rather sinister farce, I suggested. Yes, he said, preserving his impassive bearing. The farce was bound to end soon, and it ended in a very few minutes, and it ended well. Had she not come, it might have ended badly. Her brother, of course, did not count. They had slipped into the house quietly some time before. The printing cellar had an entrance of its own. Not finding anyone there, she sat down to her proofs, expecting Severin to return to his work at any moment. He did not do so. She grew impatient, heard through the door the sounds of a disturbance in the other cellar, and naturally came in to see what was the matter. Severin had been with us. At first he had seemed to me the most amazed of the whole rated lot. He appeared for an instant as if paralyzed with astonishment. He stood rooted to the spot. 
He never moved a limb. A solitary gas jet flared near his head. All the other lights had been put out at the first alarm, and presently from my dark corner I observed on his shaven actor's face an expression of puzzled, vexed watchfulness. He knitted his heavy eyebrows. The corners of his mouth dropped scornfully. He was angry. Most likely he had seen through the game, and I regretted I had not taken him from the first into my complete confidence. But with the appearance of the girl, he became obviously alarmed. It was plain. I could see it grow. The change of his expression was swift and startling, and I did not know why. The reason never occurred to me. I was merely astonished at the extreme alteration of the man's face. Of course, he had not been aware of her presence in the other cellar, but that did not explain the shock her advent had given him. For a moment, he seemed to have been reduced to imbecility. He opened his mouth as if to shout, or perhaps only to gasp. At any rate, it was somebody else who shouted. This somebody was the heroic comrade whom I had detected swallowing a piece of paper. With laudable presence of mind, he let out a warning yell. It's the police. Back, back, run back and bolt the door behind you. It was an excellent hint, but instead of retreating, the girl continued to advance, followed by her long-faced brother in his knickerbocker suit, in which he had been singing comic songs for the entertainment of a joyless proletariat. She advanced, not as if she had failed to understand the word police has an unmistakable sound, but rather as if she could not help herself. She did not advance with the free gait and expanding presence of a distinguished amateur anarchist amongst poor, struggling professionals, but with slightly raised shoulders and her elbows pressed close to her body as if trying to shrink within herself. Her eyes were fixed immovably upon Severin. Severin the man, I fancy, not Severin the anarchist. But she advanced, and that was natural, for all their assumption of independence, girls of that class are used to the feeling of being specially protected, as in fact they are. This feeling accounts for nine-tenths of their audacious gestures. Her face had gone completely colorless, ghastly. Fancy having it brought home to her so brutally that she was the sort of person who must run away from the police. I believe she was pale with indignation. Mostly, though, there was, of course, also the concern of her intact personality, a vague dread of some sort of rudeness, and naturally she turned to a man, to the man on whom she had a claim of fascination and homage, the man who could not conceivably fail her at any juncture. But I cried, amazed at this analysis. If it had been serious, real, I mean, as she thought it was, what could she expect him to do for her? X never moved a muscle of his face. Goodness knows, I imagine that his charming, generous, and independent creature had never known in her life a single genuine thought. I mean a single thought detached from small human vanities, or whose source was not in some conventional perception. All I know is that after advancing a few steps, she extended her hand towards the motionless Severin, and that, at least, was no gesture. It was a natural movement. As to what she expected him to do, who can tell? The impossible, but whatever she expected, it could not have come up, I am safe to say, to what he had made up his mind to do, even before that entreating hand had appealed to him so directly. It had not been necessary. From the moment he had seen her enter that cellar, he had made up his mind to sacrifice his future usefulness 
to throw off the impenetrable, solidly fastened mask it had been his pride to wear. What do you mean? I interpreted, puzzled. Was it Severin, then, who was? He was. The most persistent, the most dangerous, the craftiest, the most systematic of informers. A genius amongst betrayers. Fortunately for us, he was unique. The man was a fanatic, I have told you. Fortunately, again, for us, he had fallen in love with the accomplished and innocent gestures of that girl. An actor in desperate earnest himself, he must have believed in the absolute value of conventional signs. As to the grossness of the trap into which he fell, the explanation must be that two sentiments of such absorbing magnitude cannot simultaneously exist in one heart. The danger of that other and unconscious comedian robbed him of his vision, of his perspicacity, of his judgment. Indeed, it did first rob him of his self-possession, but he regained that, though the necessity, as it appeared to him imperiously, to do something at once. To do what? Why, to get her out of the house as quickly as possible. He was desperately anxious to do that. I have told you he was terrified. It could not be about himself. He had been surprised and annoyed at a move quite unforeseen and premature. I may even say he had been furious. He was accustomed to arrange the last scene of his betrayals with a deep, subtle art which left his revolutionist reputation untouched. But it seems clear to me that at the same time he had resolved to make the best of it, to keep his mask resolutely on. It was only with the discovery of her being in the house that everything, the forced calm, the restraint of his fanaticism, the mask, all came off together in a kind of panic, why panic, do you ask? The answer is very simple. He remembered, or I dare say, he had never forgotten, the professor alone at the top of the house, pursuing his researches, surrounded by tins upon tins of stones dried soup. There was enough in some of them to bury us all, where we stood under a heap of bricks. Severin, of course, was aware of that and we must believe also that he knew the exact character of the man. He had gauged so many such characters. Or perhaps he only gave the professor credit for what he himself was capable of. But in any case, the effect was produced, and suddenly he raised his voice in authority. Get the lady away at once. It turned out that he was as hoarse as a crow, result no doubt of the intense emotion. It passed off in a moment, but these fateful words issued forth from his contracted throat in a discordant, ridiculous croak. They required no answer. The thing was done. However, the man personating the inspector judged it expedient to say roughly, She shall go soon enough together with the rest of you. These were the last words belonging to the comedy part of this affair. Obviously, of everything and everybody, Severin strode towards him and seized the lapels of his coat. Under his thin, bluish cheeks, one could see his jaws working with passion. You have been posted outside. Get the lady taken home at once. Do you hear? Now, before you try to get hold of the man upstairs. Oh, there is a man upstairs, scoffed the other openly. Well, he shall be brought down in time to see the end of this. But Severin, beside himself, took no heed of the tone. Who's the imbecile meddler who sent you blundering here? Didn't you understand your instructions? Don't you know anything? It's incredible. Here, he dropped the lapels of the coat, and, plunging his hand into his breast, jerked feverishly at something under his shirt. At last he produced a small square pocket of soft leather, which must have been hanging like a scapulary from his neck by the tape whose broken ends dangled from his fist. 
Look inside, he spluttered, flinging it into the other's face. And instantly, he turned round towards the girl. She stood just behind him, perfectly still and silent. Her set, white face gave an illusion of placidity. Only her staring eyes seemed bigger and darker. He spoke rapidly, with nervous assurance. I heard him distinctly promise to her to make everything as clear as daylight presently. But that was all I caught. He stood close to her, never attempting to touch her even with the tip of his little finger, and she stared at him stupidly. For a moment, however, her eyelids descended slowly, pathetically, and then, with the long black eyelashes lying on her white cheeks, she looked ready to fall down in a swoon. But she never even swayed where she stood. He urged her loudly to follow him at once, and walked towards the door at the bottom of the cellar stairs without looking behind him. And as a matter of fact, she did move after him a pace or two. But of course, he was not allowed to reach the door. There were angry exclamations, a short, fierce scuffle, flung away violently. He came flying backwards upon her and fell. She threw out her arms in a gesture of dismay and stepped aside, just clear of his head, which struck the ground heavily near her shoe. He grunted with the shock. By the time he had picked himself up slowly, dazedly, he was awake to the reality of things. The man into whose hands he had thrust the leather case had extracted therefrom a narrow strip of bluish paper. He held it up above his head, and, as after the scuffle, an expectant, uneasy stillness reigned once more. He threw it down disdainfully with the words, I think, comrades, this proof was hardly necessary. Quick as thought, the girl stooped after the fluttering slip, holding it spread out in both hands. She looked at it, then, without raising her eyes, opened her fingers slowly and let it fall. I examined that curious document afterwards. It was signed by a very high personage, and stamped and countersigned by other high officials in various countries in Europe. In his trade, or shall I say, in his mission, that sort of talisman might have been necessary, no doubt, even to the police itself. All but the heads he had been known only as Severin, the noted anarchist. He hung his head, biting his lower lip. A change had come over him, a sort of thoughtful, absorbed calmness. Nevertheless, he panted. His sides worked visibly, and his nostrils expanded and collapsed in weird contrast with his somber aspect of a fanatical monk in a meditative attitude, but with something, too, in his face of an actor intent upon the terrible exigencies of his part. Before him, Henri declaimed, haggard and bearded like an inspired denunciatory prophet from a wilderness. Two fanatics. They were made to understand each other. Does this surprise you? I suppose you think that such people would be foaming at the mouth and snarling at each other. I protested hastily that I was not surprised in the least, that I thought nothing of the kind, that anarchists in general were simply inconceivable to me mentally, morally, logically, sentimentally, and even physically. X received this declaration with his usual woodenness and went on. Henri had burst out into eloquence. While pouring out scornful invective, he let tears escaped from his eyes and rolled down his black beard unheeded. Severin panted quicker and quicker. When he opened his mouth to speak, everyone hung on his words. Don't be a fool, Henri, he began. You know very well that I have done this for none of the reasons you are throwing at me and in a moment he became outwardly as steady as a rock under the other's lurid stare. I have been thwarting 
deceiving and betraying you from conviction. He turned his back on Henri and addressing the girl repeated the words from conviction. It's extraordinary how cold she looked. I suppose she could not think of any appropriate gesture. There can have been few precedents indeed for such a situation. Clear as daylight, he added. Do you understand what that means from conviction? And still she did not stir. She did not know what to do. But the luckless wretch was about to give her the opportunity for a beautiful and correct gesture. I have felt in me the power to make you share this conviction, he protested ardently. He had forgotten himself. He made a step towards her. Perhaps he stumbled. To me, he seemed to be stooping low as if to touch the hem of her garment. And then the appropriate gesture came. She snatched her skirt away from his polluting contact and averted her head with an upward tilt. It was magnificently done, this gesture of conventionally unstained honor of an unblemished, high-minded amateur. Nothing could have been better, and he seemed to think so too, for once more he turned away, but this time he faced no one. He was again panting frightfully, while he fumbled hurriedly in his waistcoat pocket and then raised his hand to his lips. There was something furtive in his movement, but directly afterwards his bearing changed. His labored breathing gave him a resemblance to a man who had just run a desperate race, but a curious air of detachment, of sudden and profound indifference, replaced the strain of the striving effort. The race was over. I did not want to see what happened next. I was only too well aware. I took the young lady's arm under mine without a word and made my way with her to the stairs. Her brother walked behind us. Halfway up the short flight she seemed unable to lift her feet high enough for the steps and we had to pull and push to get her to the top. In the passage she dragged herself along hanging on my arm, helplessly bent like an old woman. We issued into an empty street through a half-open door, staggering like besotted revelers. At the corner we stopped a four-wheeler, and the ancient driver looked round from his box with a morose scorn at our efforts to get her in. Twice during the drive I felt her collapse on my shoulder in a half-faint. Facing us, the youth in knickerbockers remained as mute as a fish until he jumped out with the latch key, sat more still than I would have believed it possible. At the door of their drawing room, she left my arm and walked in first, catching at the chairs and tables. She unpinned her hat, then exhausted with the effort, her cloak still hanging from her shoulders, flung herself into a deep armchair, sideways, her face half buried in a cushion. The good brother appeared silently before her with a glass of water. She motioned it away. He drank it himself and walked off to a distant corner behind the grand piano somewhere. All was still in this room where I had seen, for the first time, Severin, the anti-anarchist, captivated and spellbound by the consummate and hereditary grimaces that in a certain sphere of life take the place of feelings with an excellent effect. I suppose her thoughts were busy with the same memory. Her shoulders shook violently, a pure attack of nerves. When it quieted down, she affected firmness, what is done to a man of that sort? What will they do to him? Nothing. They can do nothing to him, I assured her, with perfect truth. I was pretty certain he had died in less than twenty minutes from the moment his hand had gone to his lips. For if his fanatical anti-anarchism went even as far as carrying poison in his pocket, only to rob his adversaries of legitimate vengeance, 
I knew he would take care to provide something that would not fail him when required. She drew an angry breath. There were red spots on her cheeks and a feverish brilliance in her eyes. Has ever anyone been exposed to such a terrible experience to think that he had held my hand? That man, her face twitched. She gulped down a pathetic sob. If I felt sure of anything, it was of Severin's high-minded motives. Then she began to weep quietly, which was good for her. Then through her flood of tears, half resentful, what was it he said to me? From conviction, it seemed a vile mockery. What could he mean by it? That, my dear young lady, I said gently, is more than I or anybody else can ever explain to you. Mr. X flicked a crumb off the front of his coat, and that was strictly true as to her, though Henri, for instance, understood very well, and so did I, especially after we had been to Severin's lodging in a dismal back street of an intensely respectable quarter. Henri was known there as a friend, and we had no difficulty in being admitted, the slatternly maid merely remarking, as she let us in, that Mr. Severin had not been home that night. We forced open a couple of drawers in the way of duty and found a little useful information. The most interesting part was his diary, for this man, engaged in such deadly work, had the weakness to keep a record of the most damnatory kind. There were his acts, and also his thoughts laid bare to us. But the dead don't mind that. They don't mind anything. From conviction, yes, a vague but ardent humanitarianism had urged him in his first youth into the bitterest extremity of negation and revolt. Afterwards, his optimism flinched. He doubted and became lost. You have heard of converted atheists. These turn out into dangerous fanatics, but the soul remains the same. After he had got acquainted with the girl, there are to be met in that diary of his very queer politico-amorous rhapsodies, he took her sovereign grimaces with deadly seriousness. He longed to convert her. But all this cannot interest you. For the rest, I don't know if you remember. It is a good many years ago now. The journalistic sensation of the Hermian Street mystery. The finding of a man's body in the cellar of an empty house. The inquest. Some arrests. Many surmises then silence, the usual end for many obscure martyrs and confessors. The fact is, he was not enough of an optimist. You must be a savage, tyrannical, pitiless, thick and thin optimist, like Henri, for instance, to make a good social rebel of the extreme type. He rose from the table. A waiter hurried up with his overcoat. Another held his hat in readiness. But what became of the young lady, I asked. Do you really want to know, he said, buttoning himself up in his fur coat carefully. I confessed to the small malice of sending her Severin's diary. She went into retirement, then she went to Florence, then she went into retreat in a convent. I can't tell you where she will go next. What does it matter? Gestures, gestures, mere gestures of her class. He fitted on his glossy hat with extreme precision and casting a rapid glance round the room full of well-dressed people innocently dining muttered between his teeth and nothing else. That is why their kind is fated to perish. I never met Mr. X again after that evening. I took to dining at my club. On my next visit to Paris, I found my friend all impatience to hear of the effect produced on me by this rare item of his collection. 
I told him all the story, and he beamed on me with the pride of his distinguished specimen. Isn't X well worth knowing? He bubbled over in great delight. He's unique, amazing, absolutely terrific. His enthusiasm grated upon my finer feelings. I told him curtly that the man's cynicism was simply abominable. Oh, abominable, abominable, assented my friend effusively. And then, you know, he likes to have his little jokes sometimes, he added in a confidential tone. I failed to understand the connection of this last remark. I have been utterly unable to discover where, in all this, the joke comes in.